central bulwark of freedom and democracy in the Pacific. It's also a leading light in the network of liberty around the world. Free nations who fight for the values that we believe in. You have stepped up on trade, on defence, and you have spoken out against tyranny. And as a fellow democratic island nation, the bonds between the UK and Japan are getting stronger and stronger. We're also working much more closely with our freedom-loving allies, and I think that's what we can see today. We can see a real collection of nations that's come together. This nexus is going to be incredibly important for the future of freedom. And that's what I want to talk about today. After serving in the UK government for 10 years, in all kinds of roles culminating in being our Prime Minister, I am convinced there is no more important issue of our time. And I'm also convinced that the next few years are going to be absolutely critical for the future of freedom. It's great that today we have so many parliamentarians from around the world who are involved in this organisation and who want to share IPAC's platform. I think it shows just how important this agenda is. And although there are many things we disagree with each other on, we share the same fundamental values. A belief in democracy, a belief in freedom, and a belief in self-determination. I know that we can make a great contribution working together on a strong response to the strategic issues posed by the People's Republic of China. And I want to thank all the people at IPAC who've worked so hard to make today's symposium happen. Let's be clear, the free world is in danger. We're living in very turbulent economic times, right through from the shock of the financial crisis through to the COVID crisis that we're still recovering from. We have less of the world's population living under democracy than we did 30 years ago. Meanwhile, we have authoritarian regimes that are building up their armaments as well as they're building up their arguments. And they're not just trying to convince their own populations. They're also trying to win over global opinion. And they're trying to create a new global world order. Now on the subject of China, which we're talking about today, no one would rather see a free, democratic, prosperous China than me. Of course I would. I'm a huge admirer of Chinese culture and civilization. I've traveled to Beijing and Shanghai and Chongqing and Wuhan long before we saw the pandemic emerge. In classrooms, businesses and factories, I've seen the application, the ingenuity and the hard work of the Chinese people. But these people are being ill-served by a regime which is about control. It's not about freedom. Some people say that standing up to this regime is a hopeless task. That somehow the rise of a totalitarian China is inevitable and we just have to face facts. But I reject this fatalism. And the free world has a significant role to play in whether or not this happens. And if it happens, how it happens. After all, we encourage China to embrace economic freedom. We believed that it would mean that the citizens of China gained political freedom. But the reality is that the opposite has happened. Nixon became the first US president to visit the People's Republic of China. His handshake would be known as the handshake that changed the world. And that was no understatement. Less than 30 years later, China was admitted to the World Trade Organization. And at the time, people didn't pay very much attention to this. But it catalyzed China's rise to become one of the world's largest economies. And it wasn't long ago 
that in the United Kingdom, we hailed the golden era of UK-China relations. We rolled out the red carpet for the Chinese president with all the pomp and ceremony that came with a state visit. I should know, I attended a banquet in his honor at the time. Looking back, I think this sent the wrong message. A few years later, China removed the two-term limit on the president. And the one-party state strengthened its grip on power at home. And it also gained even more influence on the world stage. We ignored far too many of the warning signs, from the Tiananmen Square massacre to the so-called Uyghur re-education camps, not to mention the disgraceful dismantling of one country, two systems in Hong Kong. Much of the world has turned a blind eye to these actions, at least until recently. But since it was the free world that enabled China's rise, it must be the free world that challenges its economic dominance before it is too late. We know that President Xi has been very clear. It's his ambition for China to have control of Taiwan. And in my view, this would be disastrous. In 2022, China sent 1,700 planes into Taiwan's air defense identification zone. That's nearly double the amount that there were in 2021. In 2023, we've already seen live fire drills. The message needs to be heard loud and clear in Beijing that these incursions aren't acceptable. So-called reunification is a core project of President Xi's administration. And let's remind ourselves of his words in 2021. The historical task of the complete reunification of the motherland must be fulfilled and will definitely be fulfilled. Taiwan is a beacon of freedom in a world where civil liberties and human rights are often suppressed. It's a flourishing democracy with a thriving free press and human rights and an independent judiciary. We should be doing all we can to strengthen our ties with Taiwan. We know that doing more now will help prevent tragedy later. NATO kept the peace in Western Europe and became arguably the most successful military alliance in history. And we have to ask ourselves, if we'd admitted NATO, Ukraine to NATO, would Vladimir Putin have dared to invade? Or indeed, if we put stronger sanctions in place after 2014, or supplied weapons to Ukraine earlier, would we be seeing the amount of human suffering we're seeing in Ukraine, as well as the threat to European and global security? Could we have saved huge numbers of lives? We must learn from the past, and we must ensure that Taiwan is able to defend itself. And we must work together across the free world to do this, and that is what, in my view, today is all about. I would like to see a more developed Pacific Defence Alliance, alongside even closer cooperation between NATO and our Pacific allies. I'm delighted that Japan and the UK have recently signed a new defence agreement, and the UK is the first European country to sign a reciprocal access agreement with Japan, and only the third country globally to do so. This will mean we can have more defence and security cooperation, that we can undertake complex military exercises together, and we can strengthen the UK's Indo-Pacific Security Pledge. I also congratulate Prime Minister Kishida for Japan's historic new defence strategy and his championing of a free and open Indo-Pacific. Japan has backed this up with record defence spending this year and also takes up its seat 
at the UN Security Council. We've also seen increased action from the G7, and the G7 is the body that has really stepped up, alongside our friends and allies that have worked with us in areas like sanctions, in areas like standing up for freedom and democracy around the world. In 2021, we put out a statement on Taiwan led by the UK. In 2022, it was led by Germany, and I'm sure it will be on the agenda for Hiroshima later this year under Japan's leadership. It's so important that we all do what we can to support Taiwan, because we know that prevention is better than cure. If we build up the defence links now, if we build up the economic links now, we can help protect Taiwan and we can help protect freedom. Now, of course, we need to make sure that democracies are successful economically for the good of our own populations. It's what people it's a democracy can deliver and that we have the wherewithal to provide citizens around the world with the opportunities that they deserve. Together, there's huge strength in our economies and in our economic model. And it's a model that's based on freedom. It's not based on coercion. Deeper economic integration between the Taiwanese and world economies will go a long way to help preventing conflict. The G7 represents over 40% of global nominal GDP. And if we add our friends in the European Union, and I'm looking at you, Guy Verhofstadt, we can get to over half of the world's GDP. Now that is a hugely powerful position to be in. And we need to use that economic power for the good of freedom and democracy. That economic weight means that we can influence other countries. It means that we can make decisions about how we trade, where we invest, and what technology we export. We need to use that leverage to ensure the G7 plus its allies act as an economic NATO. This means supporting freedom and not allowing it to be undermined. This opportunity isn't going to be there forever. We know that China is building its domestic market in anticipation of harder times ahead. But at present, China is dependent on exports to the West. Now is the time to make sure that commerce and trade is free and not coercive. And there are ways this can be done. We can move to an economic Article 5, where the one for all, all for one principle is wielded in defence of our values. I believe there are three areas we should focus on. Supply chains, investment and trade. On critical minerals and supply chains, we need to work together to make sure we're using trustworthy suppliers, so-called friend shoring. And that's what we've already done in the UK by eliminating Russian energy from our supplies by also eliminating Huawei from our telecoms networks. And we need more collaboration between three countries to make sure we're taking similar steps and protecting our economic security in areas like chips and areas like technology exports. And we need democracies to commit together to audit and reduce dependency in those critical industries. We cannot have a situation where Beijing has the power to turn our lights on. On investment, we need to work together to make sure it's not used to undermine freedom and democracy. China's Belt and Road Initiative is far-reaching, and it's been used to buy influence around the globe. Last year, the G7 launched the Global Partnership for Infrastructure and Investment, an alternative that is free from strings of trash. By stepping up this effort, and I know it's on Japan's G7 agenda, we can bring more countries into the orbit of free economies. And isn't it amazing that at the World Trade Organization, China is still designated as a developing country. This means it's not held to the usual rules on transparency, 
is not being held to account for its aggressive practices. This needs to change. On trade, we need to work together to make sure that trade is a force for freedom, not a force for coercion. I'm delighted that the UK is in the final stages of negotiating accession to the CPTPP, and I really congratulate Japan on the huge leadership uh, the country took on, along with Canada, to make CPTPP work and make it happen, because I think it's a huge force for good. I'd like to see this agreement expanding to even more countries, because I think it can be a bulwark for free trade as opposed to trade that is seeking to undermine the rules-based global system. We should also be seeking more bilateral trade and investment agreements with Japan, or sorry, with Taiwan. And we need to make sure that we are rushing to the defense of any nation that is targeted through unfair trade practices because of the way they speak out. Now, during Prime Minister Scott Morrison's time in office in Australia, and he re referred to this earlier, China imposed tariffs on Australian wine because it didn't like what the Australian government was saying. And they went even further with Lithuania and completely blocked imports from there, a brazen attempt to bully a smaller country. All of this was done as punishment for holding China to account and standing up for Taiwan. We have to remember that our strength is in numbers. I support Japan's efforts to create a mechanism that enables us to join forces when one of our number is targeted. And this applies to doing business with Taiwan. The more economies that do business with Taiwan, the more difficult China will find it to pressurize countries that, to change tax. There are other ways that Taiwan deserves our support. Many countries have limited diplomatic and ministerial ties to Taiwan due to agreements negotiated with China. The world has changed since then, and some of those arrangements are being rethought. And I believe we need to find ways to elevate Taiwan's status to reflect its global value. Taiwan is still excluded from many international organizations, such as the World Health Organization. It's not just bad for Taiwan, it also damages our access to information. This lack of status was very unhelpful during the COVID pandemic. We had a lot to learn from Taiwan, but unfortunately the channels to communicate properly simply weren't available. Writing this wrong wouldn't just be in our interests. It would help ensure that the people of Taiwan are able to speak for themselves rather than being spoken for. In conclusion, colleagues, Confucius warned us, study the past if you would define the future. We need to learn the lessons of the past if we're to ensure a safer and a freer future. Putin's appalling war in Ukraine serves as a stark reminder of why we need to stand up to the threats of authoritarian regimes early. Our response to the Russian invasion of Ukraine has been good and effective since the war started. Just last week, President Zelensky visited the United Kingdom. I had the opportunity to meet him and he thanked us in the UK for what we have done to support him and his fellow countrymen. But I regret that we in the West weren't tougher earlier in response to aggressive and hostile actions from Moscow. So when it comes to China, a failure to act now could cost us dearly in the long run. Our governments must signal to the PRC that military aggression towards Taiwan would be a strategic mistake. The international community should agree a package of coordinated defense, economic and political measures to support Taiwan now. We need this first and foremost to protect the interests of the people of Taiwan. But it's also about protecting our interests, ensuring trade and free navigation can continue unimpeded. We need this now before it's too late. 
free democracies need to work together if we are to live in a free and peaceful world. Thank you. ありがとうございました。え、G7諸国、EU Good afternoon, uh, dear colleagues and honorable this press. Uh, it is my great pleasure to be able to welcome the former Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, Miss Liz Truss, who 